the sweet little baby lying in the manger was born to be the Savior hanging on the cross. His whole coming was to give himself on our behalf. I run into people sometimes who think, uh, I'm kind of ashamed to go to church because I'm not good enough. Well, you don't need to worry about that. Nobody in this room is good enough. Uh, no one in any church across the nation is good enough. As a matter of fact, if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it, you'll ruin it. But the whole point is, we celebrate Christmas, the coming of Christ, and you can't really do that with just leaving him in the manger. It has to be done in a way that you recognize the whole reason for his coming. So as we look at John chapter 4 this morning, you're going to see the first time that Jesus revealed himself without any clever wording or anything else, reveals himself as a Messiah. And let's take a look. John chapter 12, we're going to begin by looking at verses 1 through 9. I'm sorry, what did I say? Twelve. Twelve? Yeah, that's, that's me. Okay, I'm going to see if I can read this number here. Four, one through twenty-six. Okay, let's look at one through nine. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Galilee and went back once, left Judea, that kind of day, and went back once more to Galilee. Now we had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Let's pray. Father, in all the world, we pick and choose who we can associate with. Thank you for this passage, illustrating your love for all people. Teach us so that we can do that as well. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the uh, the line there in verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. If you've got the King James Version, I like it better. Terrible grammar today, but I like the wording. He must needs go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. And there's a reason for that. It was God's will for him to do that. And you see the, the tension with the fact that he had to go through Samaria and the woman saying, you're a Jew, why would you talk to me? You see that tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. There is a divine purpose to this trip. It's not just happenstance. He must needs go through Samaria. Now, this is the road most Jews avoided. Most Jews, if they were in Judea and wanted to go to Galilee, they would go east, cross the Jordan River, go up the east side of the Jordan River, cross the Jordan back into Galilee. That way they avoided those evil people in Samaria by going to the evil people in Syria. It's called a game. So even though going through Samaria is a shorter route, most Jews didn't go there because the Samaritans, well, they're the descendants of the people of the land that the Babylonians left behind when they carted people off to Babylon. They're the descendants of those people and people the Babylonians brought in to live there, and they inter intermarried 
And you see in the book of uh, uh, Nehemiah, there's a problem, but that, uh, what's the other book? Ezra. You see in the book of Ezra, the fight that happens when the people who had intermarried want to then become part of what's going on with the Jews rebuilding uh, Jerusalem, especially. From that point on, early in till now, there's been this fight going on. Because the Jews considered the Samaritans not only half breed, but half pagan. They didn't want anything to do with them. So why did Jesus have to go through them? The Jews were wrong. Why did he do it now? Well, because, as I said earlier, this is a divine appointment. This is the right moment the right time, the right person that Jesus goes to. God does everything in, as the scripture says, in the fullness of time. The right moment, the right time. And this turns out to be the right time, the, the divine appointment between Jesus and that woman at the well. Now, notice that it said it was about noon. It's the middle of the day. This is our first clue about this woman. Women came to the well in the morning to draw their water for the day. This woman comes at noon. She's not welcome in the morning with the other women. But Jesus, God, is above that kind of snobbery. He's not, he's not weak about it. He's not turned the other eye and not see what's going on. But he's, neither is he, I reject you because you're not wonderful. Now, this is something that our culture right now has a real hard time with. If I disagree with you, that means I hate you. If I say, well, whatever, then that means I love you. That is wrong. You don't have to hate somebody to say, I disagree with you. You can still love somebody that I have family members I disagree with all the time. I want you to see how Jesus deals with this woman. Look at verse 10. Because it's not how many of us would. Not how a lot of preachers would. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and remember, he said, give me a drink, and she said, you're a Jew, why would I give you ask me for a drink? Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give it you, living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself and did also to his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He's using a metaphor. She's taking him literally. This is the this is why Jesus and this woman came here together. Jesus said to her, "If you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask him. And he'd give you water springing up to eternal life." That's a metaphor. That's a picture. You need water to stay alive. The water Jesus gives is eternal. Uh, it's, as, this, as the New Testament says, abundant life, not just living. You know, sometimes you go through your life and you get up in the morning and turn off the alarm clock and you get dressed and you have breakfast and you run to work and then you sit in your, wherever work is all day and then you get done and you come home and then you sit in front of the TV and veg until it's time to go to sleep and then you do it all over again the next day and you wonder, why am I doing this? Am I just existing? Is there something else? Is there something more? Jesus offers something more. Just having stuff. Okay, this is the Christmas present part of the sermon. Just having stuff isn't enough. Think about the Emperor Nero. 
He had fountains spraying perfume. He wore a new set of clothes every day of his life. His crown was worth in our do dollars a million, a half a million dollars. His carriage mules were shod with silver horseshoes. Yet he was peevish, he was gloomy, he was dissatisfied, his soul was empty, he died of suicide. Having stuff doesn't make you happy. And I, I'm, I laugh at it too. Yeah, but it sure makes it easier. Yeah, so what? Easier what? Easier to be grumpy? Jesus said, I'm sorry, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so it's not coming to me completely. Something like, even if you have a lot, that doesn't do anything for you. But the verse I want to do is, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Having a bunch of stuff isn't do it if you if you give up your soul for it. If you have your soul, if you have eternal life in Christ, everything else falls into place. So he's offering her that. He's offering her eternal life, something of great value. But she's curious. What What do you mean? Water down, I'll never thirst again. Are you, are you pulling my leg? What, what does that mean? How can I have water? Give me some water so I'll never be thirsty again. Usually when you meet someone making promises like that, it's a con game of some kind. But Jesus, he's not asking her for anything. If you, if you put the coin in my little cup here, then I'll give you eternal life. He's not doing that. He's offering her everything and asking for nothing. Abundant, eternal life. A natural life, just like drinking water, natural life demands a constant replenishment. you got to be eating something all the time in order to stay alive. But eternal life, it's different than natural life. Eternal life, Jesus said, is like a well springing up and overflowing. Eternal life doesn't need to be replenished. It overflows and feeds others. I want you to think about that. Especially when you're sitting and going, gee, I've got nothing left. Maybe it's time to reconnect and ask God to fill you so that you can overflow with him. So now she's interested. Oh, give me this water. She wants what Jesus is offering. Verse 16. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now I want you to see what's going on there. Jesus tells her, go call your husband. And she's honest with him. I, I don't have a husband. Now he's confronting her. And some people would call that hate speech, being mean. He's pointing out something that's derogatory. But notice, there's no condemnation. There's no indignation. Oh, go call your husband, you sinful woman. None of that. He's honest with her, but he's able to do it without sounding judgmental about it. 
That's a lesson for us. So, though he's nice about it, she immediately changes the subject. Oh, well, you know, the Samaritans worship on this mountain, and the Jews, they, well, they worship in Jerusalem. What do, what do you think about that? He tries to change the subject on them. But Jesus, he's not playing that comparative religion game with her. He takes her right back to God. The time is coming, and now is, when people who ought to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that's the kind of worshiper God wants. Not the person who who goes through all the forms and rituals and makes sure that he lights a candle and does this and does that and does all the religious things, but the person whose heart belongs to God and worships in spirit and in truth. You know, we come here on Sundays, praise team leads us in song, pastor gets up here and preaches a sermon, and if you're sitting there watching the show, well, that key was a little off on that note. Oh, they didn't put that high note on that song. Oh, Pastor, I've heard better sermons before. If you're watching the show, you are not worshiping. Period. See, I'm not, and the praise team is not worshiping at you. We, corporately, are worshiping God. You are part of that worship as we sing, as we preach, as we take up the offering. Whatever it is we're doing, this is part of our corporate expression to God. Worshiping in spirit and in truth is my heart seeking God as we're doing this. Now, please, don't take that the wrong way. i got to manufacture some feelings that, so I feel like I'm worth. Don't do that. Don't get caught up in that experience it. Don't try to force it. Don't try to make it. Just recognize, I'm here. God, I'm here. Take me. Use me. Empower me. That's what God is wanting. Don't try to make a an impossible thing about it. C.S. Lewis, as a child, uh, thought that he couldn't go to sleep at night until he finished his prayers, and in his prayers he had to have what he called a realization. And so he'd pray and get ready to go to bed and, and his, his uh, conscience would say, did you really have a realization? Didn't you rush through those prayers a little too much tonight? And so he'd force himself to pray over and over until he had a realization and he killed his faith doing it that. Don't play that game with God. God is there whether you feel him or not. Just surrender. Don't Faith is not a feeling. Don't try to force it. Don't try to manufacture it. Just receive. Jesus comes right back to this woman with God. Not he, God's not interested in your religion. God wants you. God doesn't care if you're a Samaritan or a Jew or, or an American or a Brit or a Swahilian. He wants you. And that's, again, a lesson you and I can learn from. She says, well, I know when the Messiah comes, he'll reveal all things to us. And he says to her, the person who's speaking to you is he. Don't miss this. Don't let that moment slip past you. In the Gospel of John, the very first person that Jesus fully reveals himself to is an immoral outcast woman. If, if the stuffy, super religious people you thought were writing the Bible wrote that, do you think they'd put that in there? No, that's a God thing. They would have, a stuffy religious person would have picked a good example. But God picks the person who touches. God's not snobbish about who you are. God's not looking at you and go, well, clean yourself up a little more and then you can come to church. The song we sing is just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. This woman and this situation, the woman at the well, it is John's illustration of John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And we're not done with this woman. We'll come back to her again. God loves the world. Even people 
with reputation. Don Richardson was a young man in the early 60s. He was a missionary, he and his wife and their, their child. They were missionaries to Papua New Guinea. You may not know where that is. That's between, let's see, make a gross uh, expan expansion. It's in the Pacific. It's between Australia and Japan and the Philippines. It's this huge island. Part of the island had been explored, but Papua New Guinea, the wet, the eastern side of the island, was completely primitive. And until World War II, there was no contact between the primitive people on that island and civilization as we think of it. But during World War II, there were a lot of soldiers uh, dealing in the island. There were airplanes going overhead. You've probably seen History Channel or something where they talk about the cargo cults and people make these airplanes out of out of bamboo and worship them because the airplanes sometimes drop great treasures from heaven. That's those people. So Don Richardson, the young man, takes his family there to go and begin preaching the gospel to these primitive people. Well, one of the things they discover, they go up upstream quite a way, they build, they ask permission, build a house, and the job, the thinking was, you're there for six months to a year, learning the culture, learning the language, before you began preaching the gospel. You have to be accepted to be part of it. So they're there, he's learning the language, he's going to translate the Bible into their language. Uh, he's trying to figure out everything he can, and finally, after about six months, he figures he knows things well enough and can speak the language well enough that he calls for a meeting with the head men and the leaders of the village. Now, these people are cannibals. Don't think of it as eating anybody you see. Now, cannibalism was specifically, it was regulated. It was a matter of warfare. If your village was at war with another village and you captured someone, they were fair game. Okay, that's the way it worked. So Don Richardson begins telling them the gospel and telling them the, the story of Jesus. And as he gets to the part where Judas betrayed Jesus, all the people there in the village listening to him start applauding. And then when Jesus is killed, they it's even, woohoo, that, that's great. And Don Richardson is, what? What am I doing wrong? What What's going on? And he's just devastated. He, he leaves. He goes back to his wife crying, Oh, what did I do? I messed everything up. And he finds out after asking some questions after some time that in their cannibalistic society, the most admired person is someone who can con somebody from another village in making them their friend and then killing them and eating them. That's the most admired person. They fatten them with friendship. Don Richardson is crushed. How do you tell the gospel to people like this? There's no way. They're on the devil's side. And so, for another six months, he and his wife are just kind of marking time. They're, he doesn't know what to do. I mean, he begins translating the Bible, but why? But he doesn't know what else to do, and he doesn't want to leave because he feels God's calling, but he just, he doesn't know what to do. After about six more months, he hears from the village elders that there's been war between their village and another village, and they want to call a truce. They want peace between the two villages. And Don Richardson is amazed to find out the way they have a truce between two villages is one village has a newborn child and they exchange that child to the other village. As long as that child is alive, there's peace between those two villages. That's the peace child is called, that's what they call it. And suddenly the light goes on in Don Richardson's head. And he calls the elders back again. And he begins telling them about God's peace child, born in a manger, raised to be like us, 
killed on the cross for our sins, and then God raised him to new life. This child can never die. So there is eternal peace between God and man. He converted that entire region. All those cannibalistic people turned to Christ because of the story of God's peace child. That's the baby in the manger that we worship. It's wonderful, the story's great, but it doesn't stop in a stable in Bethlehem. It's still going on today, and there is peace between you and God because of God's peace child. Let's pray. Father, we give praise, glory, and honor to you for what you've done on our behalf. Lord, help us to receive that message and to carry that message of love to a lost and hurting world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.